Hello, good afternoon. Hope all your phones are off and you're also aware that Kerry will be signing books after this session. So, Only if you've got them. <laughs> my name is David Laser. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. Our guest of honour obviously needs no introduction, but uh, indulge me while I give him one. <laughs> For 50 years, we've known him as a North American correspondent, a senior reporter with the legendary this Day to Night and Four Corners, a Channel 10 political editor, Late Lines presenter for six years, the editor and presenter of the ABC's flagship program, The 7.30 Report, for 15 years, and until recently, the presenter of Four Corners. Over the years, he's covered events like the Whitlam dismissal, the 1984 US presidential election, the Vietnam War, the Grenada invasion, and the Marcos coup in the Philippines. He's interviewed world leaders such as Nelson Mandela, Robert Mugabe, Margaret Thatcher, Mikhail Gorbachev, Colin Powell, Tony Blair and Barack Obama, and been one of the keenest observers of Australian Prime Ministers dating back to the days of Harold Holt. At one time in his illustrious career, he was the great man himself, Gough Whitlam's press secretary, and then Deputy Labor leader, Lionel Bowen's press secretary. He's the recipient of six Walkley Awards, one for every one of his six children. <laughs> including, I believe, two gold Walkleys and a Walkley for journalistic leadership, alongside his six children and six Walkleys. And six grandchildren. He also has four, four grandchildren? Six. Six grandchildren and two honorary doctorates. So here to talk about his book, Paul Keating, would you please welcome one of Australia's most distinguished journalists, Terry O'Brien. Kerry, we first got to know each other around 2009-10 when you moved to the Byron Bay region and you'd just come off a gruelling 15-year schedule as presenter mm. of the 7.30 report. And I recall us talking about the beauty of the Byron region and the need to put your brain in a jar and go swimming in the bay and sit under a willow tree and read some poetry. What happened? Uh, well, that was, a, that was a high point in my years of self-delusion. <laughs> <laughs> because you obviously took that highly successful, ambitious journalist with you. I mean, we take ourselves with us wherever we go. Well, so. you don't. I mean, you don't really. Um, it was more a look. It, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a tree change or a sea change, uh, but it was a. Uh, it, it suited both me and my wife Sue each of whom felt we were on a kind of, we'd done enough of a treadmill. Um, we, wanted, we wanted a different framework around our lives and we did want to feel that we had a little more time to appreciate the world around us and our kids, not totally in a kind of worrying, anxious parental way. And, um, um, and in that regard, it's been a very good move. The thing that I found, uh, uh, I have found hardest to get used to, and I'm still not, and there was a guy, this bloke invited us to a party at his place, a small party at his place, uh, within our first week of arriving in the Byron district. And there was a bloke there, um, I don't think I've seen him since, but uh, he was, he explained to me, he was a musician, uh, quite a successful one, who earned a decent living as a professional performing musician for 20 years and then he'd decided enough of that kind of, um, that sort of slightly vagabond life and that unstructured life as he put it and he came up to that area and he became, he, he was teaching, English, uh, teaching music in the local high school and he'd been doing that for five years and he said, it had, he said I was going to have his problem in reverse. It had taken, fi it taken him five years to get used to a structured life after 20 years of an unstructured one, and I was going to have to get used to an unstructured life after 40 years or more, nearly 50 years of a structured life. And he was absolutely right. And not long after you arrived, you got the job as presenter of Four Corners. Well, and then, that was, yeah, that was sort was of locked year, in. I mean, we knew that that was happening as we and came up. And then during that period, you started negotiating with Paul Keating for the four-part series. Yes. Um, did he impose conditions on you? Um, 
the only, uh, and, it, and it, it, we'd, we'd agreed, you know, we had agreed on it, and this was, this was like 2012. Uh, we'd agreed, pretty much each of us had pretty much committed to doing it, uh, and I still had to put, I had put the proposition to the ABC, the ABC had embraced it, and, and not long before we were due to actually sit down and start formally recording the conversations, he said to me, um, uh, there is a limit to what I, uh, to, to, to the extent that I can talk about my family. Mm. Uh, he expressed, and he is a private man, you know, and a lot, of, a lot of people who lead public lives are private people, and they're able to kind of reach an accommodation between the two, but I respect that. And, uh, one, and of the, one of the things that struck me about the four-part series, and some people, you had some detractors on this because you didn't go in tough enough, but it reminded me actually of the Errol Morris documentary, I think it was 2003, and he did the documentary on Robert McNamara, former US yep. Secretary of Defence, yep. yep. called The Fog of War. And the distinguishing characteristic about that interview with McNamara was that Errol Morris didn't play the bloodhound. He actually tried to humanise mm. the man who was widely seen as responsible for the, mm. the catastrophe of the Vietnam War. Was there something of that approach in your in, in, in the sense that... Um uh, Keating said, and it was a state of the obvious statement of the obvious to me. He said at one point, he said, uh, he said, of course, this is not going to be, you know, this is not going to be. At that stage, we started the ABC. I came up with the idea of a five-part series. The ABC said, how about two? Um, I said three, possibly four. Leave the door open to four, and they grudgingly, and with some slight worry, agreed because. Because television people, by and large, are defensive about what we all quaintly call the talking head. There is an assumption, which I don't share, that talking head television is intrinsically boring and that people will switch off and not come back. Uh, and I was always confident that with this guy, we could sustain an audience for what is straight, you know, person-to-person -person discourse. And that's why they were defensive about the, the extent of the series. But uh, so we agreed on three. Door open to four. Keating says to me, uh, just tell me this isn't going to be a, an extended 7.30 report where we're kind of going like this at each other all the time. And I said, uh, I said, well, of course, I'm, I wasn't planning that. But uh, I'm assuming that, um, that you are fully expecting that my questions, that there will be questions I will be asking that you won't like. He said, Kerry, you can still be the tiger and I'll be the lion tamer. <laughs> and I said, fine, you know, fine. Tell me, Kerry, you, know, you, you actually point out in, in the book that comes out of the, the four-part series that we journalists are forever fascinated by power. Mm. And since you entered journalism in 1966, you've observed or reported on or come to understand in all their light and shade, 13 of our Prime Ministers, mm. including Gordon, McMahon, Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Keating, Howard, Rudd, Gillard, and now Rudd, 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 Rudd. Yeah. <laughs> Gillard. Yeah. So as a, as, an, as a master observer of, of power, how significant is Paul Keating as an exponent of power? Well, one thing that differentiated Keating for me uh, was that he'd been such a serious insect about this stuff going back to almost his childhood. Uh, he wasn't just, you know, he, uh, I guess a lot of us, see, I was, born, I was born six days before World War II ended. He was born in the middle of the war. So we grew up as kids with a lot of war literature and history around, and it wasn't just tales being told by those who'd been at the war, and in fact often those who were at the war were the last people to talk about it. Uh, so, you know, I grew up and uh, we didn't just grow up on Biggles, we were reading a bit of history, but he was reading, he was reading Hugh Trevor Roper's book on, uh, on the, the guy who was, I think, one of the first into Hitler's bunker. Uh, but then he was reading Churchill. From, what, from what age? Oh, about uh, 13, 14. And, uh, and there was a lot of, about Churchill that he was an adventurer, but, but Keating is assessing this guy as a public figure. He's taken by 
by Churchill and decides if that's the business he is in, that's the business I want to be in. And that's exactly what he said this yeah. to you. This yeah. is the business right. I want to be in. And I yeah. he determined that by the time he was 18. Yeah, and his, and his language about this becomes more sophisticated as he gets older, but there he is at the age of 18, this sort of tall, slightly ungainly figure, but no doubt elegantly dressed. He looked like little Lord Fauntleroy in one of those early photos <laughs> with his mum walking through the streets of Bankstown in a suit at the age of about seven or eight. Uh, but he's knocking at the door of this grizzled old bugger, Jack Lang, you know, who had been, who had been one of the most divisive figures in Labor history. Uh, uh, but a giant of a man and a very uh, dominant figure, he knocks at his door at the age of 18 and says, Mr Lang, I'm Paul Keating and I'm interested in politics and labour history. I wonder if you'd be prepared to talk to me. So that's the beginning of this kind of strange friendship where they sit across the desk from each other in their suits calling each other Mr Keating and Mr Lang. And at the age of 87 and even at 90, Lang was still producing a paper called The Century, uh, which was about, you know, touring the world of politics and economics. Uh, so he was a remarkable man, and he would tell Keating things like, um, you, you, you haven't arrived, you, you know, you, you can't regard yourself as successful in politics until you've got a decent cast of enemies, was one of his lines. Another one was, uh, think of politics as a horse race, Mr Keating and always back the horse called self-interest. <laughs> um, uh, you will never meet uh, a person who will know you better than yourself. So the person whose judgment you will most trust will be yourself. Um, when people are saying things to you, look beyond their words to see what they really mean. What are they thinking behind the words? So it was a combination of cynicism, scepticism and, and I guess wisdom, the wisdom of the years. But, but what was he doing at that age asking about power? Mm. Yeah. Be because he decided that was going to be his business. Yeah. And in terms of understanding how power might get used and sitting at the knee of, sitting at the feet of men like Jack Lang, he also acquired an understanding, didn't he, of of the theatrics of power, of the psychology of power. Of I, I think, and, and I think some of the language, I, I, think, I think he was uh, influenced to a degree, possibly. I mean, he's a great student of other, you know, he's, I, th I think for a lot of his life, Paul Keating, he was such the complete kind of um, professional in his approach to understanding the nature of politics. He would, he would be looking always at the horizon, who can I learn from? And so, and he says uh, in the series, and we develop it in further in the book, that, um, that uh, you know, the best people to learn from are those people in their later years, you know, successful people in whatever field might interest him, but who, uh, who have lived a life, who've made their mistakes, who've learnt the lessons and have things to impart, what he called distilled wisdom. Mm. And so he did, you know, he had that, you wouldn't call them mentors necessarily, but he was, he was sucking the knowledge and the wisdom from all kinds of people. I mean, there was a very patrician man named, uh, uh, was it Sir John Dowling? Downing? Uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on it, it's not quite the name, but he was, he was the head of the Prime Minister's Department for many years, and he was one of the silver-haired mandarins of the Cambria bureaucracy who were as much the government as the politicians were in those Menzies years. And because Menzies, because the Liberals were in power for 23 years, uh, there was this fusion between those mandarins and, and the politicians. So Keating would occasionally go and stay at the Commonwealth Club, which was their bastion, and just happened to be there on a Friday night when the mandarins would be collecting to swap yarns about how they'd run their politicians that week. And he built a relationship with this guy, purely to understand that side of the power equation, how those senior bureaucrats operated. And he was still only in his 20s. So, but he was, able to, he was able to get their attention and their cooperation. They wanted to teach him. So that's the distilled wisdom part of it. But then there's just this natural born genius for invective. I mean, I well, mean, part you know, of that might have been Lang too, but I think, I think a lot of it was entirely his own let's, work. Let's just go through some of the things we love to remember. You know, he called some of 
um, he called Andrew Peacock the Sunlamp Kid. He the called, souffle that doesn't rise twice. Souffle doesn't rise twice. <laughs> John Hewson was the chill looking for a spine to run up. Yeah. Tim Fisher was Daisy the cow. Now, that, right. I think that's a really good one, actually. Peter. And he'd go, when Tim Fisher would come to the dispatch box to ask a question, he'd go, turn to his side and he'd go, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Costello was the talking knee. The talking knee. Yeah. Right. And he'd go, <laughs> These things are on YouTube, and they've had hundreds of thousands of hits. But what surprised me, actually, was that he borrowed some of these phrases. I mean, you, you have a wonderful anecdote about him going to meeting, Keating meeting an old drover oh, in yes. a Cooktown hotel, yep. who, when he saw Malcolm Fraser come on television, he said to Keating, you know, if I had a dog with eyes as close together as that, I'd shoot it. <laughs> Which he just, with the, he just had in the back of his mind from the 1977 election campaign. And, and he didn't use it immediately, but there was a, there was a, a moment in the parliament where Fraser, who was a very tall, um, powerful presence, and Fraser was dominating this particular debate, and suddenly this voice from the other side, you know, Keating gets up and tells this story, I think it was a point of order, which had absolutely nothing to do with anything, <laughs> and it stopped Fraser in his tracks, which was exactly what it was designed to do. And he'd just kept it there in the background for the right moment. We're here, obviously, to talk about Keating, but we can't talk about Keating without talking about the Keating-Hawk relationship, because I think it's fair to say that, that that relationship is one of the most eternally fascinating in Australian politics. And I liken it, in some ways, to the Australian political equivalent of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. You know, all the questions that have flowed from that musical relationship over decades, who wrote the better songs, who nourished the band most, who ultimately led the show. So before you answer Keating Who or Hawke... Who had primal therapy. <laughs> so before you answer Keating or Hawke, Lennon or McCartney? Lennon. Lennon. I knew you'd say that. I knew you'd say that. You wouldn't say otherwise, would you? Well, that's another subject uh, for, another, for another time. Oh, well, right. I think that... Well, I mean, maybe it's relevant to the, the discussion of Hawke and Keating because um, McCartney was the actual... He had the breadth. Uh, he could play skiffle and he could, you know, and he could play blues and he could play folk and he could, and he came from a, a rich musical tradition. Mm. Lennon was just a rocker. He was a, not just a rocker, but his background was rock. Now, with Hawke and Keating... Well, the diff well, I was going to say the difference. I mean, I'm not going to say that, Keating was, that Hawke was without creativity because that's stupid and I wouldn't say he's without imagination. But to me, the two qualities, apart from any other that lifted Keating above the fray... Was his, was his creativity, his curiosity, so that's the third, and his imagination. I mean, creativity and imagination go together. And uh, it wasn't that McCartney was lacking in imagination either, or creativity, but, but uh, the, the, both, I mean, there, was, there are some similarities in their backgrounds. You know, both had doting parents. Um, uh, we all know how Hawke's parents, his mother particularly, were telling him, his mother was telling him from a very young age that he was special, that he was destined for great things. Well, uh, Keating's mother uh, told the uh, guidance, the, the vocational guidance officer, seeing a young Paul Keating at his school when he was 14, and, and the guidance officer thinks that Keating might either be a, perhaps an architect or a panel beater, and Keating's mother said, well, actually, no, we think he might be Prime Minister. <laughs> and uh, and Keating's, Keating's grandmother, you know, as he says, filled him with the love quotient, you know, yeah. and put him on the pedestal, and they adored him. And and he says it, you know, it, allowed, it, it was like he was able to put on the asbestos suit to go through the flames with all those political... Ba that, was, that, was, that was where his confidence started building. It's not the complete... And, and he describes the difference between his mother and his father. And his father was steeped in Labor politics, but he described his father as a sweet guy and his mother as a killer. Mm. So, so that ton of love that his mother and grandmother invested in him, mm. and as you say, it, it, it gave him that, that core base confidence, self-confidence to mm. go through the hellfires. But as we know, Hawke also had that 
confidence. confidence. And that's, but from Keating's point of view, it was a sense of entitlement, which Keating says he never had. In fact, he says at his core, he, Keating, has a humility that Hawke never possessed and does and he not gave, possess. And is, is he right? Of course, Do you it's think the he's kind right? of statement that gets everybody's attention that to stop and think for a moment about all the signs we've seen of Paul Keating's humility, but he gave he gave <laughs> he gave in his terms a couple of a couple of insights to what he saw as that humility. But uh, what he was really saying about about um, Hawke's sense of entitlement was that he, he he has this repeated view that Hawke always relied on others to do things for him. Mm. That he had these people out there fighting fighting the dirtier battles and the fray while he was kind of you know, he'd walk in on a, a strike action with the with the warring parties and at the last moment he'd broker a peace. And so he was operating at that level while others... This is the Keating view, while others were out there organising his numbers for him on different things. Whereas Keating says that he always had the view that if he was going to get to the top, whatever success he had, he was going to have to earn for himself. But there's also that... When I was reading your book and watching Keating on the series, him talking to you, that coming back to the idea of humility, because both men yeah. seem like supreme egoists, but the way Keating talks he about... Says, he says, Kerry, earned confidence. That's right, yes. Not ego. Yeah. Earned confidence. Earned confidence. But Do also, go on. But <laughs> also, when he's listening to, say, Mahler, yeah. for example... Yeah. That's and he's in the thrall mm. of genius. Yes. And he talks about... And feels humbled by it. He feels humbled by it. You know, they're up there and I'm down here on my little stage. Mm. That's, his for, that's his view of the humility he has, that he knows his place in the scheme of things. And while at the one level he can tell you for hours about how he changed the face of the Australian economy and how important that was to this nation, uh, in that other context he can say, my stage was very small. And is he right about that? Oh, I think he's right that... Uh, Not about that, the stage being no, small, no, about no. him having changed the, the nation. Oh, I, I think there is an almost universal acceptance of that. And, and what, did he personally do all of it? No, of course he didn't. Um, he had this Prime Minister who had an enormous, I mean, unprecedented and before or since. No other political leader has had the, the connection to the broad Australian public that Hawke enjoyed. And it's, it's um, uh, fascinating to observe and fascinating to ponder. Um, so Keating saw that as the accumulated political goodwill that Hawke, or capital as he put it, that Hawke garnered and that Keating was very happy to spend. Uh, and secondly, there was a cabinet that pound for pound, uh, you know, someone will try and shoot me down if I say the most talented cabinet in Australian history, but certainly one of the most. Uh, they were uh, an extraordinarily um, gifted and able cabinet, and that goes nothing to... People can argue about whether their policies were right or not, but in their development of, labor, of policy under a Labor umbrella, uh, umbrella and their implementation of that policy, they were a highly competent um, functioning cabinet. So he had... He had, and there were a number of, and he acknowledges them, not on every second page, but he acknowledges that core nucleus of economic ministers in the cabinet and a couple of the social policy ministers who were absolutely fundamental to the process. But he was, I think, the chief architect of that reform process. He says the public will never understand the value that they got from Hawke and me. Which is. Do you which, think that's, that's true? Uh, Do you think we, as a nation... Well, he's doing his level best to make sure we know. <laughs> and you're his conduit. Yes, with a few questions along the way, David. You see, he didn't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Look, uh, he, he is both laudatory and disparaging of Hawke, you know, in the same breath almost. Uh, he, will, he, he is and was right through the process, first with the television series and then with all the conversations, the extra conversations we had for the book. Um, that uh, he, he was, was and is at pains that we should all know that it was a genuine friendship and that it was a highly productive relationship for, for almost all of the eight and a half years that Hawke was Prime Minister and Keating was Treasurer. Uh, he talks in that first year about... He, he used quaint terms in a way 
We were such pels, he said. We were such pels. And then he and goes I, on to call him a pathological narcissist. And, and, <laughs> and uh, during the tax debate in 85, uh, in these copious uh, pages of 10,000 newspaper articles that he kept over those, all those years, they're, they're noted in the side of one newspaper report about something Hawke had done in a tax debate, and, uh, and he's written in his elegant handwriting, envious little bastard. <laughs> and so, uh, and so the, the, you know, there are, there, are, <laughs> there are some really interesting little comments in the margins through these pages, so, so you don't, and truly, they're all digitised, so it's like flicking through an endless comic book of, uh, of history. And it's a wonderful aid. He also says about Hawke, in brutal in intellectual terms, Bob could get a... Bob could have only got a PhD in ordinariness. Which I think was pushing it a bit far. Yeah. Um, and, yes, some of, his, some of his comments were somewhat outrageous in that regard. I mean, but I know, I know what he's saying. I mean, um, Hawke was... Uh, you know, even Hawke's enemies around that cabinet table have said, mostly privately... Uh, that, uh, that, and not grudging either. I mean, I, there was genuine respect even from his, politi his old political foes around that cabinet table. He was seen as a highly effective uh, cabinet, uh, sort of boardroom or cabinet chairman. He was the chairman of the board and he vested uh, his trust in every minister, pretty much, with a tiny few exceptions, to get on with the job of running their portfolios. He was across every brief, he was assiduous in that. Uh, he, would, he would put in long hours and long days being across all his briefs, and I would have to put it to Keating to acknowledge, but he would when I did, that, uh, that while Keating was concerning himself primarily with the economy, and mind you, putting his fingers in as many other pies as suited him at the moment, like media policy or, you know, all kinds of things, um, that while he was broadly dealing with Treasury and the economy, Hawke was like the equal foreign, foreign minister. He was across every other portfolio, managing every brush fire that bobbed up, uh, handling, you know, leading the party into the parliament and, uh, and, as Keating himself says, building the political capital. And he was out doing the things that Keating hated doing, which was exposing himself to the public, running through the shopping centres and allowing people to touch his hem and so on. That's why he called him Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter, yes, that was another one. Um, so, so but, but, yeah. but, but genuine regard in those early years. Do you, do you accept, though, Keating's thesis that basically after 1984, when Hawke found out that his daughter Roz was a heroin addict, that he lost the plot, that he was unable to, not lost the plot is too strong, but he was unable to nourish and uh, feed the party and the cabinet I, I in can't, the way he needed uh, yeah. to. Uh, without having been in the middle of that process, I mean, even journalists who followed it closely wouldn't, were not in a position to make ultimate judgments about that. You'll find, you'll find some cabinet ministers from those days who are more inclined to agree with Keating than with Hawke. There are some who, who sort of differ about, and, and there was a, I mean, even Hawke himself says that he suffered a genuine depression, he would say, for a matter of weeks. Some of his close advisers said for a matter of months. Um, but, but what Keating is saying, not so much that he was in a hole of, you know, the black hole of depression for years afterwards, he's not saying that, but that, but that uh, he had stopped nourishing the cabinet, as Keating puts it. I've spoken to one of... Hawke's own senior advisers who told me that on foreign policy Hawke was always sharp but, but not so much across other areas that that, that did sort of fade, that he, did, um, that he wasn't as effective in subsequent years as he was in those first couple. He, who knows how much his confidence was affected because confidence was the key to Hawke. If, if he had his confidence taken from him, that would rattle him. He was that kind of person. That's probably true of all of us. If you're in a high-stakes game and you're used to feeling confident about your decision-making and what you're doing and where you're going, and then suddenly that rug of confidence is pulled from you, I think you'd feel quite naked. And, uh, and uh, so the 84 election, which was a double whammy for him, on the one hand, um, hubris, you could argue, 
led him into the trap of his own making where he ran an eight-week election campaign because he thought he would have a wonderful time toying with the show pony Andrew Peacock, wipe the floor with him, probably build on his already reasonable majority in the parliament that he'd won in 83. So calling an early election in the first place only 17 months in when there was no real justification for it, then making it an eight-week election and then falls in this hole around Ross, his daughter. Um, that, was, that election was a disaster for him and for Labor because uh, where they should have actually gained more seats, they didn't. They actually went backwards. And even his close friends and supporters regarded that as one of the low points of his whole life in politics. Now, that would have affected his confidence. How long for? I don't know. So it's a debate that's still open, David. Mm. But, uh, but um, I'll come back to this. You know, they had... Their, their relationship took a big hit in 85. That was the May budget. No, that was, uh, that was the tax... tax. The, so it was, first of all, the tax summit. Yep. Where Hawke had, in the 84 election campaign, suddenly, to the surprise of all his colleagues, decides to announce a tax summit in the same way that the that the, uh, the summit of consensus, what was it? What was the economic summit of 83, which was a big part of his 83 election campaign. I'm going to have this healing summit, which is going to bring all the parties together and we're going to take the heat out of union business relationships. And, and in, in fact, again, even his enemies conceded that that was a masterpiece moment for Walk. A lot of people like Keating who thought it was just a bit of puff. It actually was uh, a very successful... Um, thing, uh, pure, all, of, all of Hawke's own making and leadership. But come the 85 tax summit, Keating is privately scathing about this because he's thinking, how on earth, on an issue like tax, where you're genuinely going to reform, we all see what, what happens these days when somebody flies a kite about a possible tax reform, no matter how much virtue there might be in the argument, immediately the enemies lift up the buffalo gun and knock a bloody great hole through the middle of it and the media jumps in. I mean, Turnbull shelved his last big tax reform in two days. He floats it one day and three days later it's just gone forever. Uh, so, so, you know, he didn't like that, but they have the tax summit. Keating and his department spent months building up, uh, you know, this whole plethora of reforms, including option C, the consumption tax. Uh, he's persuaded to the argument. He spends... Days and uh, their, their final debate on this took three days on the consumption tax, and he bulldozed it through that cabinet. They then have the tax summit, where every party to that summit refuses to accept it, including his, including his mate Bill Kelty. But what he what he he said he was even prepared to forgive Bob Hawke for going in the middle of the night and meeting um, Kelty and the other trade union leaders over at a little I think a motel in uh, one of the suburbs of Canberra where Hawke capitulates on, on the consumption tax and doesn't tell Keating until the next morning. He said, I'd, he said, I'd ev he said I even forgave him that. But then when they had to go to, the, to, the, to uh, an alternative tax reform tack package, which again took months, he said um, he believes that Hawke set him up for failure with that and then left him to run the full ministerial debate on it while Hawke took off for a weekend to New Guinea comes back and, uh, according to the Keating version, Hawke says, well, how'd you go? And Keating says, we got it through. And Hawke says, all of it? And Keating says, yeah, all of it. And he said, you could feel the disappointment through the phone. So he said, he would, you know, I forgave him that other stuff, but I didn't forgive him that. So that was a low point. There was another low point in 86 over the Banana Republic. There was another low point around the 87 election timing. There was another low point around the 88 budget where Hawke says, actually, I could have a lot of people to replace Paul Keating as treasurer just after Keating had delivered this massive surplus budget that he called bringing home the bacon. Keating called that the Keating height... Called height Keating called that the height of indecency. When, yes, when, 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 Hawke, when Hawke said he was not in... Keating was not in... Well, it was political. I have to say it was politically stupid mm. because, because it squandered in one phrase, in one television performance the day after that budget, all of the political goodwill that was about, that had been garnered and was about to be garnered from that budget. And this then leads, of course, to the... Kirribilli Agreement. Infamous Kirribilli Agreement. Yeah. Uh, which then broke down after the Placido Domingo speech where... Which you were there for. I was. 
In fact, there was a funny moment to me in the, in the interview series where he was saying to me, you know, with all of the earnestness he could muster, Kerry, uh, you know, I don't know how, you know, people should not have read into that. He said, Bob Hawke's name was not in my mind when I... And it's, it's a really fascinating speech to go back and reread and then to put that alongside his description of why and how and all of the elements that were at stake in it. Quite a remarkable speech, off the cuff. But, uh, but he said, you know, there was nothing in it about Hawke, none of it related to Hawke. He said, um, uh, he said uh, um, uh, if you'd been there, you know, you, and I said, well, I was actually. And he said, oh, <laughs> you were there. I said, yes, what did you think? I said, I thought you were talking about Bob Hawke. <laughs> like every other person in the room. And uh, which doesn't mean he was. I mean, it's fascinating, really. The, the, the dynamics of... He was talking about greatness. I mean, just to remind everyone, he was, everyone, about, he was, he was talk talking about the absence of greatness or greatness in or terms great of... Leaders. Great leaders. At, at, at pivotal times in history. And he was talking about... He said America had three. Washington, Lincoln and Roosevelt. At big moments in their history. And that we had not had those. And, and he was sort of saying, Curtin kind of came close in the Second World War, but it, I don't think he used the word trier, but it, but it was sli slightly disparaging of Curtin, who of course was a, an immense hero of Hawke's. So when Hawke took umbrage and, uh, and said, you know, how dare you speak about John Curtin like that? And Keating says, well, actually, he was really saying, how dare you not include me in your list of greatness? So, so by this stage, the, the atmosphere had become poisonous between the two of them, and as far as Hawke was concerned, that was the end of the Kirribilli Agreement. And uh, Keating says, well, you know, I didn't... When I, when I said um, political leadership isn't about tripping through shopping... going through shopping centres, tripping over television cables, he said, I didn't actually... I wasn't actually referring to Hawke uh, when I said that, but even if I was, is that such a villainous thing to say as to cause him to renege on this, um, you know, this well carefully um, uh, agreed to agreement for transition of leadership. I mean, a unique moment in Australian political history where you've got Sir Peter Abels there for Bob Hawke and Bill Kelty there for Paul Keating, mm. witnessing this agreement being made on the handover of um, yeah. passing of the baton. Yeah. And none, none of the rest of us knew anything about it for another two and a half years. But Keating said to you that he never thought that Hawke had any, had ever any intention I don't think he, of honouring he, he, that he, agreement. I don't think he thought that then. Uh, but he says that Blanche Del Puget's, uh, whose updated um, edition of her biography of Hawke, she wrote the, the, her biography of Bob Hawke uh, way back in the, at about 1980. And, of course, they were married when she did the updated version in 2008 and uh, it was certainly favourable to Bob and it was certainly unfavourable to Paul um, and he says um, that that was the point where up, up to that point Paul Keating felt that they had come some way towards a kind of rapprochement uh, but not after that and in fact, in fact I think it's true that if it wasn't for that book, he would not have done the television series and this book would never have existed. Just on that... So thanks, Blanche. <laughs> did you enjoy the process? Uh, parts... Look, in, in an overall sense, yes, I did. Um, uh, did you and Keating become friends? Uh, no, I think it's... it's uh, I say in the foreword to the book, it's, uh, political friendships are complicated... And, uh, and relationships between journalists and politicians are complicated. And uh, while, um, while I think there, are, there have been and are true friendships in politics, not many of them endure the span of careers. And that is partly the nature of politics, you know. I mean, how many people can you really trust? Uh, and that's, a part of the, that's part of the kind of intricacy of democracy. And, and compromise, and um, you know, we come to hate the word compromise when that compromise is not to our liking, and we can be comfortable about it when it is. That's democracy. I mean, the issue about compromise is the point at which we go a step too far in the compromise. But compromise is fundamental to it, and sometimes in those compromising and those deals, friendships are destroyed. But the relationship between 
Paul Keating and me, I think is probably, uh, as I, I said in the forward, that it's uh, a comfortable professional relationship between a journalist and a politician who have known each other for a long time. I have uh, substantial respect for uh, significant aspects of Paul Keating's life and times. Um, I, I suppose he must have come to respect me or he wouldn't have done the series unless he thought I was a knockover. But um, so friendship, hard to say. You know, I, I like him. But um, do I have reservations about aspects of him? Yes. Would he have reservations about aspects of me? I'm sure he does. He can probably point to pages 9, 14, 23, 86, <laughs> 112, 214 and so on. So he takes, he takes Hawk down in 91 mm. and he becomes Prime Minister and I actually thought that his Prime Ministership wasn't that long but when I looked at it he, 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 was, he served longer than Curtin, Holt, McEwen, Gordon, McMahon, Whitlam, Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott. He served four years and three months. It was actually a significant yeah. tenure. And give us your assessment of that prime ministership. Well, it's an interesting one. I, I think uh, even people who felt that they, covered, that they followed politics closely would be surprised at the list of initiatives that he, that he um, put into play at least, if not delivered on. Um, and, I mean, Peter Walsh said of him uh, when he became Prime Minister that he looked to Walsh, and Walsh was an interesting figure and a complicated figure in his own right, um, and they, they had a complex relationship. A lot of respect for each other, but, but each uh, would, would not need to spend much time telling you, uh, you know, thinking of the things that, they, that worried them about the other. So Walsh's view of, of Keating was that he was like the dog who'd been chasing cars all his life and when he finally caught one, didn't know what to do with it. And, uh, I mean, Keating bridles at that, but at the same time he said to me that in the series that, um, that when he became Prime Minister it took him months to get his head properly back to where it had been because after he lost the first leadership challenge against Hawke, he went to the back bench and was there for something like four or... Well, about six months and uh, and and he said you know if you can just imagine it after a lifetime of politics but then uh, eight and a half years in the pressure cooker uh, uh, cauldron uh, of the Treasury in probably the most intense period of, of reform in Australia's history and suddenly that all stops and he's on the back bench and he's looking here and he's looking there and John Brown says to him, you're looking for something to do after politics, what about a piggery? You know, so he's dabbling in a piggery and he's uh, presumably buying, a, buying antiques and, and he's sort of half there but, but, but he'd seriously switched off. So there was a kind of a, I don't think it was quite as Walsh said, but it took him time to, be, to get that brain really firing. But if that's the case, he was pretty interesting on half a brain functioning because... Uh, because uh, within a month of taking over as Prime Minister and putting in a new cabinet, he and John Dawkins, as his treasurer, between them, uh, came up with a whole big blueprint that was as uh, detailed as just about any budget, uh, which was to be Labor's answer to fight back. Because the main reason Hawke fell, it wasn't through white anting or anyone trying to come at him a second time, it was because Hawke was seen to fail the Hewson challenge, the new opposition leader, with this bold 600-page manifesto of new radical new policy reform. And, and John Kerrin as Treasurer was not up to John, the task. John Kerrin as Treasurer was not up to the task, and, mm. and you have to say Bob Hawke, uh, as Prime Minister, without Keating at his back and beside him, um, failed to land a blow on fightback. I mean, Keating saw it as an ideological document and felt that that was the basis on which you fought fight back, but Bob Hawke was having it costed and trying to find economic arguments to defeat it. And, uh, and so uh, when, when Keating arrives in the Prime Ministership, I think the government's stocks were down in the low 30s. Keating's personal approval was something like 28% to Houston, 62%. Within a month, he and Dawkins have come up with a document that they called One Nation. This was before Pauline Hanson 
<laughs> read her head. And, and it meant what it was supposed to mean. So it was a document that was um, getting the economy going again and it had a whole number of made pr promises and forecasts and, and programs that were designed to stimulate the economy. And suddenly Paul Keating was a Keynesian. And, uh, and within two months, he was landing serious blows on Hewson. And over that year, it's quite interesting to look at the seesawing that took place. I mean, at no point during that year did people really think Keating could turn the tables around and actually win an election. But, but the polls showed that he was competitive at that level. And even right up to the end of 92, they were still seesawing and there'd be little, little glimpses of a possibility of a win, but nobody believed it. Tiny, tiny percentage of people believed it and the rest of us would have thought they were mad. Um, so, you know, if he was the dog who didn't know what to do, he, uh, he learnt fairly quickly. Something in your book which I was absolutely fascinated by, which was that it tells you that... I mean, he was a great fan of Geoffrey Tozer, the pianist. Yeah. yeah. And the night before, or the afternoon before, he challenges Hawke for the leadership. The second time. The yeah. second time. He is in his overalls at Tozer's apartment. Just, just pause on that for a second. Paul Keating in overalls. <laughs> <laughs> And he's helping Tozer paint his apartment. He's with got his, his advisor, Mark Ryan, there with his, as well. Yeah, with his, with his, um, and then the next morning, as he's about to go to caucus, he's actually washing the, the paint off his face. Probably scraping it. Scraping it. You know, if you've ever had the old paint spots that have dried on your skin and you've got to kind of... No, so that's what he was but, doing but, as he's preparing to go to caucus to be elected Prime Minister of Australia. He's taking the paint off that he'd been... Geoffrey Tozer was this, I mean... Uh, obviously. But that, I just want to just yeah, sorry, fin on. finish the question because we we look at Keating as the treasurer, the yes. reforming treasurer, re treasurer, and the deregulation of the labour market and the financial market and the product market and dropping of tariffs and all of the reforms, the floating of the dollar. So all of that over an eight and a half year period. And then he became his prime minister. We and a recession. And a recession, the the one that we had to have, or that he yep. said we had to have. Yep. But then twenty four years of consecutive growth. So, and then there's Mabo, and then there's the conversation about the Republic, and that's then right. there's the APEC Leaders Leader. Summit, that's right. and there are the Creative Fellowships and the, all of this sort of stuff. So, but to go back to the keeping the man, because mm. this is what I think fascinates us all about, about Keating in, in a way that... Some of us, David, there are some out there who just dislike him. Well, but know. even if they dislike him, you know, I still think that he's a, he's a, he's a figure of fascination. Yeah, absolutely. And no one would say that you have to like him. No. And you can loathe him. But he... I mean, a, a, a man who's about to become the Australian Prime Minister who is painting a, a an impoverished pianist's apartment... The it wasn't an apartment. It was an old convent building... Okay. that he'd persuaded Tozer to buy um, because he... You've sort of got to... He just... Look, you finish your question and then I'll... Well, I, I, just, I, I just want to... It, it, it's it's, the question goes to the aesthete hmm. in Keating. And I'd like... You know, because the, I think at the end of the day there's something of the political tragedy in Paul Keating. Um, and I wonder whether you could speak to that about the sadness that you might have detected in the man. He talked to you about when his father died, he never got over the sadness, but he actually says something very interesting and I think quite beautiful, yes. that sadness rounds you out. Melancholy. Melancholy yes. rounds you out as yes. a human being. Yes. And did you, did the fellow Irishman... How can you have a life without sadness? And the sadness actually, the experience of the sadness not being a part of who and what you are and of understanding life, I mean, yes. And so... What did you and how see? many other politicians could you say you've heard speaking like that? Mm. In that kind of, in such a, an expressive, reflective, deep-thinking way. That's what I respect in him. And that sadness then extends to, in fact, the end of his prime ministership, which is where I see perhaps the tragedy. Not only does he lose to Howard, and as he says to you, he gifts John Howard a reformed economy, the greatest gift any Australian Prime Minister arguably has been given, a reformed economy, he loses to Howard and he also loses his marriage. Mm. Soon yeah. after, yeah. He, uh, we, we did have, and I sort of crafted the questions carefully because I knew it was important to him and I respected, as I said, 
his right to a private life as well. But, um, but we talked at several points about family and the interplay between the public life and the private life and the politics and family. And I asked him um, whether either he or Anita had really any idea what they were getting themselves into um, when they decided to marry and this, this beautiful, sophisticated, multilingual European woman wakes up one morning having agreed to marry Paul and she wakes up one morning in Bankstown uh, and I'm not deriding Bankstown, I'm talking about two massively different worlds and a few doors away is a very strong woman who is Paul Keating's mother and, uh, and I think that over the course of the marriage um, there were times of uneasiness I think between those two women this is me saying this um, and uh, and I, so I say to him, uh, so she lands there in Bankstown, suddenly she's deep in suburban Australia and she's having children and you are well embarked uh, on a career that is consuming you and is going to continue to consume you possibly for decades. Do, did either of you have any idea what you were getting into? And he says, probably not. And we talked a little bit more about that then. But, you know, when he becomes treasurer, they get into government, he becomes treasurer, he decides, they decide, that they will live in Canberra, so there is some better chance that they can maintain a family life, a life and a relationship while he's pursuing all these things in politics. But you get a sense, I had a sense at times from Anita, that she, um, she wasn't necessarily all that happy in Canberra with, with the Canberra environment either but she busied herself with particular things and there's no doubt she was the sort of the focal point of keeping that married that keeping that family going uh, and then we come to the end and uh, and I, I broached the question of the cost the personal cost of a public and political life like his. And he, and, he, and he mused about, and I don't think he'd ever said this publicly before, that, uh, and it helps to explain some of the bitterness he feels, I think, about Bob Hawke. Uh, he clearly blames the fact, not completely, but to a significant degree, those last three years, which was a kind of stretch too far, he felt, for him, and perhaps for them. Uh, he blames the stresses and the strains, particularly of those last three years as treasurer, uh, for the ultimate failure of the marriage. So is he saying, ipso facto, that if, if Hawke had honoured the agreement, the Kirribilli agreement, and handed over to him in 1990, mm that he and Anita might have still been together. Might That's have the implication together. of what he said. Mm. And, and, uh, and, uh, and mate, so that uh, makes you know. the vituperation, the attacks on Hawke, the, je the jealous bugger, the mm. PhD in ordinary... Well, some of those actually, things were happening back in 85. And no, but he's saying it now. Yes. He's saying it yes. now. Yes. And, it, you know, the spleen that's behind those words, do you think it's informed by the fact that he actually is blaming Hawke for the, for the unravelling of his marriage? Blaming Hawke? Well, I think that's part of it. I think that's part of it, uh, the kind of bridge too far for a relationship. And, and, and think about, I mean, he got sick at one point after the 88 budget, uh, developed tinnitus or tinnitus, which is a, a kind of whistling in the ears that uh, is not with you all the time. But how's this? After two years of endless conversation with Paul Keating, I woke up one morning with tinnitus. <laughs> there you go. Um, but... Uh, uh, you know, he, he saw himself as engaged in this endless struggle through that budget process. They had something like 15 or 16 budgets and mini-budgets through those years, each one accompanied by anywhere between six and ten weeks stuck in this dungeon in the middle of Parliament House called the ERC process, the... Expenditure Review. Yeah, Expenditure yeah. Review Committee, yeah. which was where they would have ministers, you know, the, the line of ministers at the door with their budget, with their, you know, government... Uh, with, with their ministerial requests for money for the next budget and there was Peter Walsh with his pencil sharpened and, and uh, John Dawkins and Keating cutting 
and cutting and cutting and cutting for years because of this terms of trade crisis that they had with the, around the Banana Republic and all that stuff. So there were years and years and years of that intensity. And I've got to tell this because I, I you know, every time I heard it, it I, had, I had preliminary conversations with him before I could decide, make the assessment and decide, yes, this would work as a series of television interviews. And the first time he told this little story, I thought, yep, that'll be there, you know, that's going to be in it. Uh, where he tells just this little spontaneous memory he has, uh, the, 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 the picture he paints of the cabinet room where he and Hawke and Beasley and Walsh and a couple of the others are there and they're all smoking cigars. And uh, at this stage he's decided that the white paper of the endless treasury documents reflecting the fluorescent lighting back up into his eyes. And so by this stage, he's got a tennis shade. He's wearing a tennis shade. He's tried to persuade Treasury to change the colour of their paper to green, and they've refused. And, uh, and he's got these guys smoking their cigars around him. And he said, you know, and he's talking about trying to, trying to think through this filtered, light of, filtered blue light of cigar smoke. Uh, I mean, he really, you know, as he would talk about these things, you could see him reliving them in his mind. And he's, you know, he wasn't enjoying the process. So, so he, th those, those things were very real to him. And, when, and that extra three years that he talks about, uh, even though Hawke wasn't going to give him the leadership in 88 or even 89, but if Hawke had stuck to the deal that within 12 months of the 90 election, which was early 90, so say by the end of 1990, the transition had taken place in an orderly way, that doesn't just mean that he'd become Prime Minister by 1990. It meant that, that if it was clear all the way through that Hawke was going to stick to the deal, then that means that those two years were relieved of the ongoing tensions and doubts with him, with Anita, uh, uh, tensions in the office, tensions between he and Hawke. All of those things would have been removed. And so he'd have had a clear sight of a process and theoretically they'd have all got on with it and everyone would have been happily ever after and Paul would have been Prime Minister without any blood. So you can sort of see what he's saying. And he would have handed over to Kim Beasley and there would have been... When, when would have been interesting, you know? I mean, very, very, very few. The last politician to actually hand over succession in an orderly way and to be the master of his own departure from politics was Robert Menzies in 1966. Mm. Uh, look, we're nearly out of time, Kerry, but I just... You were, we were saying, you were telling me before we came on stage. He wouldn't let me talk about it beforehand. There was one, you kept coming back to me. I said, no, Kerry, we're going to talk about it on stage. But you did say to me that that event at the Opera House, where you and yep. Keating are there, and you were called by the Opera House uh, managers before the day, and, and they... Well, it was, it was uh, within 24 hours but it was an in, in, in of, of the... them opening for bookings. Yeah, OK. And, yeah. And it was an in the round, and they and then they keep ex they kept extending. Well, it was it was it was the recital hall at, at the opera house, and originally they were just going to open the main body, and then they rang and said, "We've had such a huge response. Do you mind if we open the sides?" Well, why would you mind if they're going to let more people in? And then a couple of days later, they rang back and said, "Would you mind if we opened up the back section? It would mean you'd have people, you'd have your backs to six or eight hundred people." And again, we said, "No, that's fine." What but if that, you're talking about what it was like... No, I'm, I'm actually going to ask you, what do you think that says about the hunger that we have still oh, for... Massive. The, for I, I think it's very significant. Uh, eloquent. Uh, I mean, he was greeted by a roar that went on for about four minutes and it only stopped when we sat down and started talking. We kind of had to force them to stop. And, and uh, truly, mate, uh, standing ovation at the start, standing ovation at the finish... And, and what that hunger is, I believe, uh, is a hunger uh, not for a sort of false, not a false nostalgia like, you know, Farlap and Tulloch were better than today's horses or if only Muhammad Ali would come back in boxing. Um, I, 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 think it's, um, I think it is very much about the paucity of modern leadership in politics. I think, it's, I think it reflects a disillusionment with the state of political parties, with the state of political debate. But fundamentally, I think about the failures of leadership and the ordinariness of leadership that mostly surrounds us in Australia these days. 
and which I think is an affliction in pretty much the, much of the Western world. I mean, he was the last figure who seemed to regard good policy as good politics. Well, that was sort of his... That was what he consistently says was the approach that he wanted to take and the approach that he did take and that he says was about changing the nature of the way politics had been played. Mind you, there are, there are other factors at work in all of this. I mean, uh, I think it's true. He certainly thinks it's true. Other politicians I know who were there at the time and, and went and lived on through the political process say the same thing, that 1975 changed the relationship between opposing politicians in Parliament House, that, uh, that friendships across the chamber were far less likely to be had these days, they do exist, that a spirit of bipartisanship was all but destroyed. And when you think about the issues on which today we should see our politicians in a very mature way being committed to a bipartisan approach because they're too important to the nation not to be, like climate change, like asylum seekers, um, even, even broadband, you know, even NBN, things that really are fundamentally important to our future and to who and what we are when you're talking about the travesty and the shame of um, places like Nauru and Manus. I don't, uh, for one moment, um, um, reduce to simplicity the... the the challenge of the issue of, of border security and of the, the massive failure of all the nations of the world to deal with the millions and millions and millions of displaced people through no fault of their own. Uh, but no matter, no matter how tough that challenge is for us as a nation to be saying that we can justify being as cruel or possibly crueler than some of the countries these people are fleeing from, what are we to be content with that? And, and I'll, just, I'll just very quickly finish this, David, because, because you see, I, I have thought, I had thought, and I still hope that with Malcolm Fraser, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, that, uh, no, well, this, is, this is important, that with Malcolm Turnbull on an issue like that, but particularly on that issue, uh, which is only going to be resolved with a bipartisan approach because the well has been poisoned. The debate on refugees was poisoned with tamper and it has never recovered. And, and the only way it can be recovered is through a bipartisan approach. And Malcolm Turnbull has that possibility because... There are decent people on both sides of politics. Uh, there are people on both sides of politics who privately are appalled with the state we now find ourselves in with that regard. Uh, so one can only hope, but, uh, you know, these windows don't stay open for long. So I think that was a really good note to end it on. We're actually Might hearing, the one you hearing Kerry O'Brien, the man, as opposed to Kerry O'Brien, Brian, the, the journalist, the interviewer. But I just want to say on behalf of everybody here... Congratulations on a masterful book. It is a masterful book. It's a huge contribution to Australian history and politics and um, your television series as well. But also on your contribution to the national conversation over 50 years. Thank so you, on behalf of uh, all of you here, I'd like to thank Kerry O'Brien. Thank you, Mike.